What's up everybody? Today, of course, testing's finished. Generated so many questions. So I've taken a massive selection from across all the platforms, from Twitter, Instagram, right here on YouTube, and of course the Seedstream app as well. I've got questions around testing itself, the times that were posted. I've got questions around sandbagging in testing. Questions around the technical aspects of barge boards and other aero services, racing points, Ferrari. And of course, when we're talking about Ferrari, I'm gonna save the second half of this entire video to that subject that's generated more questions than I think I've ever had in any of my Ask Elvis videos, that FIA statement and Ferrari's power units. Welcome to another Ask Elvis. Right, let's kick it off uh, with this one around testing from Jaden Cadogan who says, in testing when someone goes off, why do they red flag the whole session instead of the usual yellow flags in the area where the incident took place? Uh, it's mostly because at testing, at test tracks, they don't have the same infrastructure uh, as they do at the race, tra uh, a race event. They don't have as many marshals, first of all. They don't have the same cranes and facilities by the side of the track to remove cars. And so, because there's also less pressure in terms of keeping a race event running, they just minimise the risk by stopping the session, allowing the marshals and recovery vehicles to get onto the circuit and, uh, and get it removed and cleared before they restart again. Now this one comes from the Mighty Kane who says, uh, Racing Point has a car that looks like the 2019 Merc and we know they can buy bits but they have to design the rest of the car themselves by the rules. We know Merc can give them bits of the car but can they give them advice and tips on how to operate it, how to get the best out of it? Great videos, love watching them. Thank you very much. Now that is the big question right now that lots of people are, are raising in the paddock. You know, how much assistance were Mercedes able to give Racing Point when it came to designing their 2020 car? The rules state that as a manufacturer, you have to design certain components like the aero surfaces, like the chassis, yourself. And that means you can't just take the Mercedes drawings and manufacture pieces from them. But that's very easy to, to do. It's very easy to design your own thing that looks very similar and operates in a very similar way. And I suspect that's absolutely what, what Racing Point have done well within the rules. What is being questioned now though, is just how much assistance are Mercedes able to give? Are they able to give real real kind of life advice on integrating things like the uh, the power unit into uh, that that what was a very similar chassis to what Mercedes had last year are they able to give advice and tips on how to develop that car throughout the season the areas that they were developing paths that they were developing that perhaps they didn't actually pursue at Mercedes but potentially could work with the racing point are they able to give some of those that advice, some of that knowledge, some of that understanding, some of that early development that Mercedes may have done with last year's car that maybe never made it to the race car, can they pass that on to Racing Point? And that is something that there's no specific rule around at this stage, but potentially is a dangerous precedent, isn't it? Because what you end up with is a sort of parent team or a sister team or however you want to describe it, which is fine and it's great if you're a Racing Point, it's even great if you're a Mercedes, but is it great if you're one of the other teams that are trying to fight against these people? And actually that triggered a follow-up response because Ram Attack went on to say, why would they? Why would they help Racing Point? Why would Mercedes want to do that? Can't think of a single reason. Well, there you go. The reason, as I just said there, if you're a Mercedes, it's great to have somebody fighting alongside you at the front of the field with very similar technology as you because they can potentially take points off your main rivals. Hey, Ferrari and Red Bull. Uh, Siddharth Maha Devon says, Hey Mark, do you think we will have a championship this year with a good chance that Ferrari might not be able to take part in certain Grand Prix due to the coronavirus issue? Your vids are epic. Again, thank you. Uh, do you know what? I think the bigger issue is that we may not have a championship at all. And I think that's a very real possibility. Just uh, in the last day or so, uh, over this weekend, uh, MotoGP, of course, have cancelled their first two rounds. Um, and, you know, one of those is Qatar. I know of events that have been cancelled in Bahrain. 
I think it's almost certain in my mind, and of course, you know, I'm no, I'm no health expert. We have to take advice on all of this, which Formula One will be doing. But I think it's a very high possibility that we will lose more races this season and we may end up starting the championship somewhere like Zandvoort. This is going to be an unprecedented situation, perhaps. Uh, Bob Campbell says, quite simply, who was the most frustrating driver you've ever worked with and why? <laughs> That's a good leading question, isn't it? Um, and I thought about this and I can think of two. One was Fernando Alonso because, and it's, perhaps this is obvious, because he was such a good driver, such a talented driver, and yet it was so frustrating that his political side really, I mean, in my opinion, and I, I have some experience from this, of course, held him back as a racing driver. You know, his, his, uh, the other side of his personality, the political side of his personality, for me, has stopped him becoming a kind of multiple, multiple, multiple world champion. You know, he was as good as Lewis Hamilton, you know, in my opinion. And look at what Lewis has gone on to achieve. Fernando, for me, could have done something like that. But now he's burnt so many bridges. Even just look now. Nobody wants to take him. The other one is probably Kimi Raikkonen. And, uh, and I say that with a big smile on my face because I absolutely love Kimi. I loved working with him. The frustrating part of Kimi was that I think that Kimi was probably... Possibly the fastest racing driver I ever worked with around the sort of 2005 period of, 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 uh, of his career. The frustrating part is that he was never the, the sort of most complete racing driver. And if you think of somebody like Lewis who has gone on to maximise every single part of his performance, the team's performance, continues to keep pushing himself to extreme levels to be the best that he can be. Kimi hasn't done that. Kimi was incredibly talented and made the most of that talent back in the day, but probably could have gone on to do so much more if he had the passion, the desire, the willingness to push himself even further. And yet, you know, back then he was just enjoying life too much. Difficult to knock him for that because he had a great time and we all had a great time <laughs> during that period. But, you know, perhaps it was frustrating that he could have been seen as perhaps one of the best racing drivers in the world, you know, in the history of Formula One, if he'd pursued uh, to the sort of same levels as people like Lewis Hamilton have gone on to do. Uh, Nate Your Bay says, uh, Hi Mark, do you think there's any good chance the grid will be balanced for next season in 2021? Because I'm getting seriously bored if the Mercs win again next season. Um, <laughs> I mean, look, 2021 is a reset. There is a good chance for everybody to have a complete redesign, a complete reset, and, and potentially, you know, it offers the opportunity for anybody to come out on top. But in reality, Mercedes have built not just a winning car over the past six seasons, but they've built a winning formula. And that will not stop. That will continue. The, the ground, the base blocks that they've built at Mercedes, the management, the leadership team, the people they've got in place now, will all continue being brilliant. And so whatever rules you throw at them, you've got to say they stand a very good chance of coming out on top again. But uh, I certainly wouldn't write it off just yet. Let's wait and see, because I think that's what's most exciting. No one really knows. All right, David Walton says, uh, I've been watching Drive to Survive, and I remember the question I've thought of a hundred times. Does the filming helicopter downwash affect the car's aero? I've seen pilots flying low and above the cars, and I always wondered about it. Uh, the answer to that is no, and there are very strict rules about how low that helicopter can fly. So although it may look like the shots are right above the cars themselves, the reality is they are actually well out of the way. So very deliberately, the helicopter pilot steers well clear of the cars for that very reason, as well as the obvious reasons of safety and everything else. But yes, it doesn't come into close enough contact to affect the aero of the cars. Uh, Jonathan Moore says, um, so six days of testing, is that enough? Is that too much? What were the teams like? 10 days, 20 days? Can you have too much testing? Can you hit a wall where you're just not learning anything about the car anymore? Uh, that's an interesting one and the reality is that teams would test every single day if they could because I don't think you can ever learn enough. You can never be too well prepared. And of course, as fans, I don't think we want the teams to be that well prepared, but as a team, that's exactly what you want. So if they could test every day, that's exactly what they do. And back in the old days, that's pretty much what we did. 
Uh, Phil Lee asks this one around sandbagging and testing. He says, uh, why do teams do so much sandbagging? Once the other teams have seen all the cars in the flesh, then surely it's better to find out how good your car is in all setups, including qualifying. Um, yes, it is, and I, and I don't believe that sandbagging happens to the level that most people believe it does. Um, you know, people do hide performance. You may well have seen at the end of testing on Friday, Max Verstappen setting a very fast lap, but then backing off uh, just before he crossed the line so that the the ultimate time didn't flag up on the sheets. Now a few people ask me why would he do that and the reason that people do that, pe the reason people hide their ultimate performance is not because they, they don't want to push the car to its limit, you know Max will have pushed its car, the car to its limit all the way around different sections of the lap. Perhaps they'll do it on different laps, perhaps they'll be pushing incredibly hard through sector one on one lap, sector two on a different lap and sector three on a different lap. The reason for all of that is that to, just to try and avoid the headline times because if Max Verstappen had crossed the line on Friday and gone half a second quicker than anybody else, the headline writers would have absolutely suddenly written them to the top of the uh, all of the headlines. They would have announced them as favourites for the championship because that's how the F1 media works. And um, you know there would be an, an untold amount of extra pressure on the team. That's the first thing that team bosses will try and avoid. But also, if you suddenly light the timesheets up and suddenly show something that is blisteringly fast, you not only add pressure to your team, but you also bring an awful lot of unwanted attention. People start looking into your car a bit further. They start to wonder how on earth they've managed to do this. And you get a bit more scrutiny than you otherwise would. And if you've got elements on your car, which every team has, that might be pushing the limits a little bit, the very last thing you want is somebody delving into those, you know, in a, on a forensic level because the chances are they will find something and it starts to lead to questions, potentially protests, and all of those things you just don't want. So by, by staying just off the radar in terms of the headlines, you can get on with your own program in a much more calm, controlled way without unwanted watching eyes looking over your shoulder to the same extent. He leads on. Come here. Good boy. Good boys. There we go. Come on then. Uh, Dan Katz says, You frequently refer to the artistry of the bargeboard area, and rightly so. My question is, is there a reason the whole car doesn't look as intricate? Is it cost, regulations, or simply that the barge board is a vital transit hub to receive the direct airflow around the car uh, and has a more complicated job to do? Uh, so many thanks for all the great work you put into the channel. Thank you, you're all being very kind today. I really appreciate it. Um, so Dan, uh, the answer is that you've sort of touched on it there yourself. Uh, nice the way you've worded it. It's a transit hub, I like that. The barge board is very much a flow control device. Uh, and that means that Actually, each of those little sort of um, intricate pieces on a barge board, they're all actually quite draggy. They are, they're not, um, they create a certain amount of drag because each one of those little fins is designed to generate a little vortex that combines with the piece behind it. And all of that is designed to direct airflow into a certain area, either towards the rear of the car or away from the car, but it has a very specific job to do. If the whole car was as intricate as that, it would be an incredibly draggy car. So most parts of the car, you want to be as smooth or as, as uh, slippery, if you like, so that the car slips through the airstream. The downforce producing parts, like the wings, of course, have a very specific job to do as well, about a big surface area that's going to uh, change the direction of that airflow, that's going to help generate downforce to push the car into the tarmac. The barge boards are an area that its primary function is to control the airflow to those specific areas around the car. So the offset that the drag, the drag penalty from those barge boards is well worth taking because of the greater benefit that you get from it by directing the flow in a more energized fashion to the areas where you need it most. Uh, right, and on the similar subject, uh, the future is bright says, I understand the general concepts behind how wings generate downforce, but I never understood how vertical elements like in the barge boards are able to do it. So I guess my question is, how does a vertical element produce downforce? The very simple answer to that is, it doesn't. 
uh, not on its own. And as I've just described there, those vertical elements on the barge board are flow control devices rather than downforce producing devices. So hopefully there goes your, there's your answer. Uh, ben Guest says, now that you're watching F1 as a fan, not that you weren't from the pit lane, <laughs> absolutely right, have your opinions about anything changed or have you noticed anything different that wasn't as obvious from the inside or perhaps that's not as obvious from the outside? That's quite a good question, isn't it? And actually there is one thing that jumps out at me. Having switched over from inside the garage to the media side of Formula One for a number of years, the uh, the the sort of... The things that the drivers have to go through over the course of a race weekend, particularly on a Thursday, I think escaped me completely really when I was in the garage because on a Thursday I was always busy working on the cars, of course, but now having been in the pen in the paddock, having seen these drivers being whisked around from one media group to the next, being asked essentially the same questions, <laughs> I can see how these drivers hate Thursdays, how they find them so frustrating and how sometimes you get answers to these questions that are so dull, are so uninspired. It's not necessarily because the driver is, is trying to be difficult, quite often it's because they've been asked exactly the same thing 20 times already and answered it in exactly the same way and by the end of that process I imagine any of us would find it very hard to keep up the enthusiasm to keep answering it as if it's the very first time. So that's probably my, I have a, a newfound respect or understanding for what drivers, the demand, the media demands on a driver are. Given that they're racing drivers, their primary reason for being there is to drive the cars. A huge part of their job is constantly trying to put on a, a smile and a representative face to represent the team and the brands that uh, are paying them to be there. That, I think, is something that I overlooked a little bit when I was on the inside, but good question. Uh, right, let's finish this part of the video with this one from Andrew Harwood, who says, Hi Mark, we know the teams and drivers were all testing all sorts of things over the last two weeks. Were the broadcasters, uh, that's FOM, Liberty Media or other groups, testing things during this time? And if so, what do they normally test? Yes, they do. That's a really good point. So yes, people like Sky and in fact probably all of the live broadcasters will use this as a full dress rehearsal for the first race. You know, just as importantly as it is for the teams to get things right when they turn up in Australia or wherever the first race ends up being. Um, it's the same for the broadcasters and they don't get many opportunities like the teams to be able to try that out. So they're testing out their new equipment. Maybe they've got new radios. Maybe they've got new things as simply as, as new team uniforms. Do they work? Is there a problem with them? Is there something that's uncomfortable? Is there a place to clip your radio on? Really simple things like that. And of course, all of the technology that goes behind the broadcasting, which is hugely complex, a massive setup. You know, to be able to install that into a circuit at Barcelona and run it as if you're running a race weekend is a really important part of the process. They may have new kit, new cameras, new, new anything. So it's a really great opportunity, just like it is for the teams and drivers, for the broadcasters to be able to do exactly the same thing. But good point. Right, uh, I'm going to finish my coffee and then uh, we're going to crack on with the Ferrari side of this debate, the Ferrari FIA statement that was released with 10 minutes to go at the end of Friday testing. What was all that about? Right, let's get into this then. On Friday evening, the last day of pre-season testing, just 10 minutes before the session was due to end, the whole of pre-season testing was due to end, when there were no more scheduled briefings from Ferrari or from the FIA, nobody there to ask about this from the FIA at that stage. This was a case of burying some bad news right at the end of the day. The FIA released this statement, which says, the FIA announces that after thorough technical investigations, it has concluded its analysis of the operation of the Scuderia Ferrari Formula One power unit and reached a settlement with the team. The specifics of the agreement will remain between the parties. The FIA and Scuderia Ferrari have agreed to a number of technical commitments that will improve the monitoring of all Formula One power units for forthcoming championship seasons, as well as assist the FIA in other regulatory duties in Formula One and in its research activities on carbon emissions and sustainable fuels. 
discuss. Um, so, uh, there were so many questions around this. I'm gonna pick this one from Mike Bryant because it pretty much sums it up. But there were so many. Mike Bryant sums it up nicely by saying, would love your thoughts on the behind doors penalty on Ferrari from last season. That verdict and the drop in performance has to be an indicator of something shady, right? Right, Mike, you said it and so many other people did as well. Now, there are so many bits of this to pick apart. First of all, let's look at how the communication was delivered because for an organisation like the FIA, this is the governing body of our sport, the team of people who should be communicating the sport, not just to, you know, not communicating these details, not just to the teams, but to us, to the fans, to the whole world. And yet they've done it in this unbelievably almost comical shady way by slipping in this little statement without any big fanfare without any announcement that it was coming slipping it in just sort of sliding it underneath the door just before the door closed at the end of, of pre-season testing first of all for me that's a massive failure on their part that's a terrible mistake to make because whatever the details behind this people like mike and many of you and me are now heavily questioning why it was done in this way. Why was it done in such a underhand, low key, shady fashion? Because it was shady. That's the first thing. So immediately that arouses suspicion. And then let's look at the details of the statement which go no way to dispelling any of those shady myths. I mean, look, the idea that it's concluded a thorough technical investigation. Now this of course came about when Last season, post summer break, Ferrari had this incredible, massive boost in performance, particularly in engine performance, and that manifested itself in straight line speed. Now, all of the other teams, certainly Ferrari's main rivals, were able to see this very clearly because the GPS data that's available to every team, it all comes from that overhead camera pod sitting on top of the car. Every team has access to that. It's actually used mainly to show the positioning of cars around the racetrack. And that's used for media, but it's also used for the teams to position themselves, for example, when they want to, you know, strategize how they're gonna come out after a pit stop, for example, they need to know exactly where the position of every single car is. That's what the data's there for. But teams now have very, very clever and accurate analysis of that GPS data because the positioning is now so accurate within a couple of meters um, that they can tell the performance in terms of acceleration and speeds by using that data along a straight, for example. Now they can tell by comparing that data to data before the summer break, for example, with a Ferrari, how suddenly their performance boost in a straight line had taken a giant leap forward. And the reason that suspicion was aroused is because it was such a giant leap forward at a period in these regulations after six years, almost, you know, where uh, most people had come towards the upper end of their development path with these power units. They're looking for tiny little margins at this stage after that long spell of developing these units. For Ferrari to take such a, dry, a giant leap forward, people raised eyebrows at it. How on earth is this possible? So that's how suspicion was arisen, it was arose. Um, now, of course, the questions started coming. The FIA obviously had a little look into this and were asked questions by people like Red Bull, theoretical questions like, if we were to do this, would it be legal? And that was talking about things around the fuel flow and around oil burning. The FIA said no, that would not be legal and issued some technical directives. Now, after those technical directives were issued, Ferrari's performance tailed away again, noticeably. Now, we can all draw our own conclusions to that. You know, without proof, I, I'm hesitant always to sort of say anybody was cheating, but it was all looking very suspicious at that stage. And then there were further things, weren't there? In Abu Dhabi, Ferrari got actually, actually got caught and fined for uh, issuing the wrong fuel uh, level on their car. So submitting the wrong fuel level to the FIA on Charles Leclerc's car before that last race. They got, that was, a, that was a slam dunk penalty, but they got a fine. Not the most severe penalty in the world. Now, of course, everyone's thinking all these things must be interconnected with each other. And so at the end of the season, the FIA took away Ferrari's power unit 
investigated it, literally stripped it apart, went and sat with Ferrari, going through the technical drawings, understanding exactly how it worked, how it operated, and that was the investigation that we've now just seen this conclusion to. And so having uh, concluded our thorough technical investigations, um, we have reached a settlement with the team, the specifics of which will remain private between the two parties. Now, you and I can sit there and go, that's, you know, that's ridiculous. We all want to know what's going on. We all feel like we deserve to know an answer. That's one thing. The other teams involved in Formula One, they absolutely deserve an answer because they were fighting against Ferrari. If they were fighting against a Ferrari with an illegal power unit, that calls into question everything. It calls into question the, the points that they won, the points that their, their rival you know, opposition were then able to win because some of those points were taken by Ferrari. That has a massive financial impact. Points mean prizes, literally, in Formula One. So you know, that can have a cascading effect all the way down to the smaller teams who may have picked up bigger points had Ferrari been thrown out on some technical infringement, if indeed that's what's happened which could make a huge financial difference to those teams. So first of all, I don't expect this to be a conclusion. I expect this to rumble on unless there's some very, very shady deals going on behind the scenes between the FIA and other teams preventing them or persuading them not to put forward further question marks over this investigation and this statement. Who knows what might be going on? But there's a very big argument to say lots of people, lots of stakeholders in this sport should be very upset with this. Least of all, us as fans and media. And then the, th the final part of the statement goes on to talk about Ferrari essentially getting what looks like it amounts to some kind of community service with the FIA helping them and assisting them in research activities on carbon emissions and sustainable fuels, helping them to uh, improve the monitoring of power units in forthcoming championships. These are the kind of things that teams don't do voluntarily. They have been asked to do this. Now, have they been given some kind of deal to avoid much more severe punishment? These are all the questions that are now being thrown up, legitimately being thrown towards the FIA and of course Ferrari. This doesn't help anybody. The FIA look bad in this. Ferrari look bad in this because, you know, the assumption is that there's guilt somewhere here. Ferrari surely can't be happy with the way this statement is read. You know, if Ferrari are innocent, they should be very upset with this. If Ferrari are guilty, they've got to be looking very sheepish at this point because the whole world is questioning what they've been doing. And Formula One looks stupid off the back of all of this because how can we have a regulatory body who has such terrible communication and clearly when there's such a significant investigation going on, which, all right, Ferrari didn't win the championship, but what if they had? And it shouldn't make any difference if they had or not. The impact of what Ferrari potentially were or were not doing and what was being investigated was huge on so many levels. So, I mean, this is a proper rant and I haven't really gone into all of your specific questions but to answer Mike's question because he was the one that I chose there uh, yes is this a you know is the drop in performance and let's not forget pre-season testing Ferrari's engine performance was definitely nowhere near what it was last year now if a team goes backwards in its engine performance between one season and the next that's a major problem because the point is we're developing we're supposed to be getting faster and faster unless they've had to change something that was giving them a big performance advantage last year, which is now outlawed. And if that's the case, well, that does not look good for Ferrari. So I expect this to rumble on. I expect there to be more questions, you know, m mostly from the media, but surely from the teams as well. And I would hope that we will get some kind of clearer statement from both Ferrari and or the FIA on this. And if we don't, me, personally, I'm going to be very disappointed, and I'm sure you guys will as well. I think we all have a right to ask further questions, given this pathetic statement that's been released by the governing body of our sport. So I don't normally get this angry about something, but the FIA, for me, should be the, the whole... They should be running this sport in a calm, level-headed, fair, transparent way. And that statement seems to go against all of those things.
Right, we'll see where it goes uh, and uh, maybe we'll pick it up further down the line. But, um, you know, I want to know your thoughts. I've got lots of your thoughts, actually, but do keep them coming. I do appreciate it. Thanks for all the questions uh, this week. There'll be more uh, over the course of this week. I'll be back with some other stuff. And, of course, most of the teams head off to Australia uh, later on uh, this week as well. So lots happening in the world of Formula One. Uh, we'll wait to find out what impact coronavirus has because I expect there to be further changes to our calendar over the coming days. Uh, but in the meantime, as I say, thank you very much. Uh, if you like the video, give it a thumbs up. If you haven't yet subscribed to the channel, please do. That would be great. I'd really appreciate it. And I'll see you all very soon. Ta-da.